Thanks for joining. We do have heat. It just isn't here. <laughs> so, it, and it wasn't an assumption that you were going to be boring and that we were going to fall asleep, but I'll be the first one to should have coffee. So anyway, our first speaker uh, dealing with research activities is Brian Hornbuckle. His title's on the board. Brian is a, an associate professor in the Department of Agronomy. Do you have a joint combination with the uh, geological and science? Geology and Atmospheric Sciences. So, without further ado, I won't take any more of your time. Thanks for joining. Hey, again, my name is Brian Hornbuckle. Can you hear me okay? I'm a faculty member here in agronomy and also geological and atmospheric sciences and also electrical engineering. So you might think about how do those things go together. Hopefully it'll be obvious as I go through the presentation here. I'm gonna be talking about making satellite soil moisture work here in Iowa. So there are two currently uh, new satellites that are orbiting Earth. One was launched by the European Space Agency at the end of 2009. It's called SMOS, which is an acronym for Soil Moisture Ocean Salinity. And it's been making observations of what we call soil moisture for the last five or six years, since 2010 essentially. And then just recently, NASA launched a similar satellite. This one's called SMAP, or Soil Moisture Active Passive. The idea was that SMAP would improve upon SMOS in terms of the spatial resolution of its measurements. So when a satellite looks at the Earth, it integrates over an area on the ground. We call that the footprint. Uh, SMOS's footprint is about the size of an Iowa county. SMAP was going to improve that to about the size of an Iowa township, or about six by six miles, something like that. Unfortunately, the active part of SMAP went kapui at about July this year, so maybe we should be calling it SMOOP now instead of SMAP, <laughs> but it still goes on, and we're uh, working to use these measurements to tell us about a, an important quantity of water, which we, we call soil moisture. You know, it was launched January 31st, and we've had a year to look at what SMAP has been doing here in, in Iowa. So here's some details about what these satellite observations give us. Number one, they're measuring what we call the volumetric water content of the soil, which is simply the volume of water per volume of soil. Anybody, what is the porosity of soil. How much airspace in terms of percent by volume do we have in a, a, a typical soil here in Iowa? What's a typical porosity? How much of a soil is air versus solids? Roughly. Can I answer? Yeah. Twenty-five percent, ideally. 50, oh well. Fifty percent if, if total it's porosity. Total, total porosity would be how much? Fifty percent. About 50%. So if the soil is totally saturated, all the pore space is filled, that would be a 50% volumetric soil moisture. Okay? So we're measuring volumetric soil moisture. Ranges between maybe around 5% for a really dry soil up to 50 for totally saturated, but only in the top five centimeters. So it's a very thin layer, um, but however, it's an important layer that I'll talk more about here in a little bit. The other char another characteristic of these measurements, again, I mentioned, is what we call the spatial resolution. So what is the finest detail that they can see on Earth? And these numbers might be a little shocking to you for people that are thinking about other applications, but the finest detail we can see is about 40 kilometers, which means there's only one measurement per Iowa County, essentially. That may not sound very useful to you, but I'll argue in a little bit that it is very useful. And then finally, uh, how often do these measurements happen? Both SMOS and SMAP pass over us at either 6 a.m. in the morning or 6 p.m. in the evening. And these measurements happen about every other day. And that's important because soil moisture can change pretty rapidly in time. It rains, soil moisture goes up quite a bit. And as uh, water evaporates and plants take up water, the soil moisture can change also pretty rapidly. So we need to have these measurements as often as possible. Okay, so why do we know, want to know about soil moisture? 
And specifically, why do we care about just this thin layer of soil moisture at the surface? Um, the short answer is that soil moisture, although it's not a lot of water, plays a very important role in the global water cycle. So this is a picture, a cartoon of the different parts of what we call the water cycle. The arrows tell us about fluxes or movements of water from one reservoir to another. The boxes represent the size of these different reservoirs, like glaciers and snow, lots of water there, lots of water in the oceans. And then look at soil moisture, a tiny number. However, soil moisture is a very critical reservoir because it's right at that interface between Earth's surface and the atmosphere where a lot of water transfer takes place. And we can look at this in terms of one of the most important physical principles, the conservation of mass and energy. If we think about rain, precipitation, how does rain get partitioned? Here's my, that's my water balance here at Earth's surface. When it rains, it either the water either runs off or it soaks into the ground and is later used by plants as they transpire that water. It might soak into the ground and drain to deeper levels. That's the D here. And it's also going to change the amount of water that's stored in that surface layer that we call soil moisture. Okay. So knowing about soil moisture is going to tell us about where water is going. It's also related to what we call the energy balance of Earth's surface. Sun comes up, solar radiation heats the ground. What happens to that energy associated with solar radiation? Well, it can either heat up the ground, that's the G term. It can heat the air near the ground, that's the H term. Or that energy can be used to evaporate water, change it from a liquid to a gas. And so, soil moisture plays not only a critical role in the water balance at our surface, but also the energy balance at our surface. So why might soil moisture at 40 kilometer scale be important? So this is not soil moisture that you can use to tell you about what's happening in the south 40 acres of your farm field. You can't use it to tell you whether you need to water your grass or not. This is one measurement for an entire county. How could that be useful? Well, it's useful if we're thinking about the global earth system. And it's probably useful to get better at predicting weather and climate. That would be a useful thing to do, and that's what soil moisture can help us do because of its critical effect on this water and energy balance that happens at Earth's surface. And this is a, the best illustration I've been able to find about the effect of soil moisture on weather and climate. This is getting a little dated now, but does anyone remember what happened in 1993 here in Iowa? <laughs> a lot of my students were not born in 1993. <laughs> What happened in 93? Sandbags. Sandbags. Big flood. Des Moines lost their water for a month or more, right? Okay. How about in 88? It's also getting back in time there. 88 was the big drought year before we had the more recent one, right? So what this illustrates is the difference in rain between those two summers, 93 versus 88. Red means really wet in 93, really dry in 88, and you can see we were in the bullseye right here. It's very wet 93, very dry in 88, okay? That's what we observed during those two summers. Here was the model prediction made by the weather and climate models at that time. There's no red spot, okay? They totally failed at trying to understand or predict what was going to happen during that time. What they used was typical soil moisture conditions, or in other words, what we expect them to be like during a typical summer, but those weren't typical summers. Okay? When they went back, this is before we had satellites to tell us about soil moisture, when they went back and, and tried to make the soil moisture more realistic, here's what happened. The red dot came back. So 
the big picture here that I'm trying to argue is that soil moisture, because of its effect on the water balance and energy balance at Earth's surface, is extremely important, especially when we have extreme weather, either extreme dryness or extreme wetness. It's a key. We need to know about it in order to be able to predict these extreme events in the future. And not only do we have extreme dryness sometimes, but we have extreme wetness. And that's a big issue for Iowa, the flooding that we've had. And what we know about how the Earth system is changing, what we've seen here in Iowa is springs are getting wetter, and we expect that to continue. And that's something that we really need to be concerned about and think about how we're going to deal with that. Knowing about soil moisture, how much is going to soak into the ground, and how it affects weather and climate is going to be a good thing for us to do. So here's my argument about why we need soil moisture and why at 40 kilometer scale is okay right now. You know, we want to get better than that in the future. But we, if we know about soil moisture, we're going to be able to better predict weather and climate. We're especially going to do better with drought and extreme wetness. Of course, plants need water going to help us with predicting agricultural productivity and also flood severity and extent. And these are all really, really important issues for Iowa. So having these new satellites that measure soil moisture is a great thing and we need to take advantage of it. So just a few slides here on the physics of it because I like physics and I think people ought to know a little bit about how these things are working, all right? So what these satellites do is they're basically cameras up in space that are measuring radiation that's naturally emitted by Earth. In fact, you're emitting some of this radiation right now. It just happens because we have a temperature, all right? Everything emits radiation. We're measuring what's called the microwave radiation, which actually is the same microwave radiation you use in your microwave oven to heat food up. But we're measuring this natural microwave emission that's being emitted by the Earth. It's at a wavelength of about 21 centimeters, frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. So this is in what we call the microwave region, which is in the bigger radio spectrum, which we share with TV, FM, and AM radio signals. These are longer wavelengths than infrared and longer than the wavelengths that we use to see. That's an important point because the consequence is that these longer wavelengths can see through vegetation and into the soil. I can't see through vegetation and into the soil. But it's because I'm using, I'm looking at wavelengths that are very small, very short. The longer the wavelength, the less they're affected by vegetation and the deeper we can see into the soil. And that's the big difference between visible or infrared remote sensing and microwave remote sensing. And basically here's how it works when the soil is dry the soil emits a lot of this microwave radiation. And Smos and Smap are up here listening. We're looking for this radiation that's emitted by the soil. But as soil gets wetter, this emission or radiation that's emitted by the soil goes down. So it's a very straightforward relationship. More radiation emitted by Earth means that Earth's surface is drier. Less means Earth's surface is wetter. That's the basic physical principle. Can you go back to the slide that shows the rainbow? Uh huh. So you've got your arrow right there at 21. Yes. If you look to the right or left, would you sample deeper or shallower? You're right, that's a good point. So theoretically, if we moved farther this way, made our wavelength even longer, then we'd be able to look even farther into the soil and be even less affected by vegetation. And people are trying to do that, but the problem is. We don't have the technology to do that efficiently. That was my follow-up question. How do you decide how to do it? Because well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, there are, we're listening to the natural emission. And of course, we know, take out your cell phone, there's lots of other uh, radio waves going around, right? 
we have certain protected bands that the international community has agreed to not broadcast in. And we have to stay in one of those protected bands in order to not listen to your cell phone conversation, for example. One of them happens to be right there. There are other ones too, but then the problem is you run into technology concerns. The longer the wavelength, typically the bigger the antenna you need, and the bigger antenna, the more expensive it is to put it up in space. So this is kind of a compromise for right now. We're working on technology that would allow us to use longer wavelengths, but we're not there yet. Great. Okay, so here's the uh, part where I'm going to be asking uh, your opinion about some things. Uh, we're going to look at how well are these two satellites, SMOS, launched by the European Space Agency, and SMAP, launched by NASA, how well are they doing in Iowa? How do we find out how well they're doing? Well, this is what we do. And it sounds a little strange, but this is the best that we can do at this point. We go out in an area and we stick soil moisture sensors in the ground. And we measure the soil moisture in situ in place. Okay? And we do this at about 20 different sites over about a 40 kilometer area. Now you may think this is crazy because if you go out right now and measure the soil moisture here and walk one meter over here, it could be very different. Okay. However, what we found is that if we measure enough sites and average them together, we feel like we get a good estimate, or at least the best estimate we can, of what the true soil moisture is. Is that the true soil moisture? Is anything true? We don't know. But it's at least a standard that we can use. Okay? The network we have is in the watershed of the South Fork Iowa River, which is just northeast of here. It's been set up by the USDA ARS and also by NASA. Okay? So this is the standard that I'm going to be comparing satellite soil moisture to. And here's the goal. Both SMOS and SMAP have a goal of having what we say no bias. In other words, to not be too wet and not be too dry. On average, they want to hit the standard. Okay. The other standard is that they want to have only about a 4% uncertainty in the measurement. They want to be within 4% of what we think the actual soil moisture is. So here's my question. How many of you think SMOS, well, what do you think SMOS is? It's, does SMOS have a bias? Is it too dry or too wet? Or is it hitting the mark? What do you think? Is it too dry or too wet? Do you have one for too dry? Or is it right on? Okay. We only had one brave soul guess here. It's a total guess, right? How are you going to know? <laughs> only I know. SMOS is too dry. <clears throat> By about 9%. In Iowa, according to these measurements on the ground. And furthermore, the uncertainty is a little bit more than what we'd like to see. It's about 5%. Question. So, 40 kilometers in the area, how would you set just one? Why not 50? Measurements? Yeah. Well, cost mm -hmm. and practicality. Number one, we've got to find. 20 people who are going to allow us to bury soil moisture sensors on their farm and let us access it whenever we want to. Cost. The more we have, the more expensive it is. Replacement. They're going to fail. The more there are, the more we have to maintain, basically. So it's a compromise. Okay, so now you can really vote. Do you think NASA's SMAP is doing better or worse? than SMOS. Come on, it's U.S. versus Europe here. Who's going for the U.S.? All right, how about for Europe? Okay, we've got more for Europe. Here's how SMAP is doing. It's also 9% too dry. And it has the worst uncertainty. 
mainly due to these big points that are far off the, the figure up in the upper right when we have very wet soil moisture. Okay. So we're not doing very well here in Iowa. And what we're trying to do is understand why that's happening. What we found out so far is it's not because our soil moisture sensors in the ground actually measure a different soil moisture than the satellite does. Because the soil moisture sensors have to be buried into the ground. We don't want them popping out all the time. And the satellite is measuring that very top surface. But we found out that's not the reason why. Number two, it's not because SMOS and SMAP are getting interfered by other wireless signals like airport radars. That was a concern. It's not because we're using wrong input data, in this case input temperature. We need to have an estimate of the surface temperature in order to do soil moisture retrieval. That's not the reason. It's not because SMOS and SMAP are using wrong soil properties, which affects the models that we use to retrieve soil moisture. So it's not all these things. Perhaps it's the wrong model. That's what we thought. And that's what I'm going to show you the results of right now. And by wrong model, I mean is that the radiation that's emitted by the soil, which is our signal here, is mixed up with also radiation emitted by the vegetation and radiation emitted by the vegetation that bounces off the soil. SMOS and SMAP are both treating the vegetation as pretty simple right now, and we think it's more complicated than that. So we made a modified SMOS product. This is the old original SMOS product. Again, 9% too dry, 5% uncertainty. Do you think making the model a little bit more complicated made it better or worse? Better or worse? Okay, more people are saying worse. Here's what happened. It got worse. 14% too dry. The uncertainty got a little bit better, but the bias got a lot bigger. So it's not that, or at least not that change in the model that we need to make. So what are we going to do? Oh, and SMAP's experimental product is also 11% too dry, worse than its original one also. So what are we going to do? Well, one thing is that NASA and the ARS are coordinating a field experiment called SMAPVEX 16 Iowa that's going to be happening this summer here in Iowa in this watershed just northeast of Ames in the South Fork Iowa River. There will be about 50 scientists here from the U.S. and Europe and there will be two what we call intensive operation periods. One at the end of May and beginning of June when there will be very little vegetation and one in August where we'll hit basically the peak amount of vegetation here in the Corn Belt. Here's what we're going to be doing. Uh, well, here's the area again. So here's Highway 20 going through here. Here's the dip in 20, right? And here's Interstate 35, Ellsworth, Hubbard, Eldora, Iowa Falls, and Williams. These are the sites of the soil moisture sensors that are measuring soil moisture in the ground. And what we'll be doing on days that SMAP goes over is we will be sending out teams of people to measure more soil moisture, to make uh, destructive or uh, gravimetric measurements where you will actually dig into the ground, take a soil sample, weigh it, dry it, weigh it again, so we can verify that our network is working correctly. We're hoping to make about 60 measurements at about 60 sites as compared to the 20 sites where we have automated measurements. We'll also be measuring as much of the vegetation as possible. We'll be going out measuring its height, and most importantly, the water in vegetation, because it turns out it's the water <coughs> in vegetation that disrupts this, this process. And then finally, if you're in this area, here's an airplane that you might see on some mornings during those two intensive operation periods. It has a SMAP 
simulator here underneath that will be making measurements as the plane flies up and down, up and down the watershed, mapping out the, res the, the watershed at a finer spatial resolution of about maybe a kilometer, something like that. What airport will you be flying on? They're actually going to be, they, they were, they, there, there wasn't space in Des Moines, so they're actually going to be flying from Dubuque. Is that the Unfortunately. DC-3? Pardon? Is that the DC-3? I think so. Wow. I don't. I couldn't tell you. I could. I can look if you want to ask me afterwards. I can tell you, but I don't know right offhand. So when you talk about how you're going to actually dig in up and drive, yes, that brought the question: How often do you calibrate the ones that are in the ground? They've been calibrated to the soil at the specific sites uh, at least one time. You might do that again to see if they've aged or changed at all. Okay, so here's the summary. We have these new satellites that are measuring soil moisture from space, and hopefully you are accepting my argument that this is really good for Iowa, because it's going to improve weather and climate prediction, tell us about drought and extreme wetness, of course, agricultural productivity, and also hopefully forecasting how severe and extensive these floods might be. Problem is that they're not working right now in Iowa. So we're working to figure that out. And what we think we'll have to do is modify these models that we're using right now. They're just too simple. And uh, more specifically, we think that we have to take into account the fact that tillage and other land management things happen in Iowa. And it turns out that tillage roughens up the soil surface and changes the emission almost as much as soil moisture does. And of course, people originally thought, well, we don't need to worry about that. We can assume a constant, what we call sur surface roughness throughout the year. And I think we're finding out that that's not a good assumption to make. And then the other thing that we think we need to do is make the, the, the vegetation model a little more complicated to take into account some things that we know that happens to radiation in corn. All right, thanks. We're only going to, we'll have some sites in pasture, but, um, you know, 80 to 90 percent of that watershed is in row crops, and so obviously we'll be focusing on, on that. How about other parts of the country? Is it, does it work better in other <coughs> It's doing fine in the grasslands of Oklahoma, but what doesn't happen in Oklahoma? There's no tillage that happens in these grasslands, and the vegetation is relatively simple and very homogeneous. So it's doing fine in some places, but it's more complicated here in the Corn Belt. So, so please take everybody to no-till cover crops then. <laughs> It would change, we would have to change the model again to accommodate that too, because then we have growing vegetation at different times of year that we don't expect these days. But it would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So are you hoping that it could be as simple as when corn is two foot tall, you take 14% off, or when it's four foot tall, that that is influencing the data? We're hoping that it's as simple as this, that it turns out that SMOS and SMAP both can be made to so the biggest effect is vegetation, all right? And right now, SMAP is getting the information about vegetation from another satellite. SMOS, on the other hand, can figure out or infer how much vegetation is there at the same time as soil moisture. And we can make SMAP to do it the same way. So what we're hoping to do is, my graduate student I work with is going to say, up until the end of June, what SMOS and SMAP see are changes in soil surface roughness. From June until the end of August or harvest, what SMOS and SMAP see are changes in vegetation. And then from harvest until end of November when people are doing fall field work, what SMOS and SMAP see are changes in soil roughness. And if we do that, we're hoping to solve the problem. Thanks, Brian. Okay, I'll talk to you later.